All right, hello, we're going to be covering chapter 38, Vehicle Extrication and Special Rescue. Um, so this, this uh, chapter, chapter 38, um, it, it, essentially what we're doing here, we're not um, intending to, um, to turn you into extrication specialists or rescue techs. Um, this is simply to understand your role in the event of uh, a rescue or an extrication as an EMT. Um, so a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about throughout this um, chapter um, you know, are things that you're not going to be directly involved with, but that you're going to be held in a support role until that victim is rescued or extricated. Um, and then you're going to take over as, as, the, um, as the in charge EMT. Um, so most of these things that, that we're going to be talking about today require uh, additional training, training beyond the EMT level. Um, we're going to be talking about just some basic extrication concepts, just so you're aware of what is happening um, during these runs and what your again what your role is as an EMT. Now, certainly, I do, I do want to preface before I move on. Um, you know that if you are uh, you know dual trained, if you are working a, you know for a fire department as a, a rescue tech, uh, an extrication specialist, something like that. Um, certainly, you know you may have a different role, and you can combine those roles. So, if you're working as a uh, a firefighter in a department and you're trained as a rescue tech um, and then after this course you know you're going to be an EMT um, you know you may have uh, a, a combined role you may be working as a rec rescue technician with the mindset of an EMT um, but for this lecture so if, if that applies to any of you um, for this lecture just just keep in mind that we're talking about folks who are operating solely as an EMT um, and what that person's role is uh, during these rescue incidences. All right, so let's talk about safety. This is the most important topic to discuss um, when we talk about um, rescue incidents and um, auto extrication. Um, extrication requires mental and physical preparation, so the priority is to provide patient care, um, but you need to consider safety of yourself and the team. Safety begins with the proper mindset and the proper protective gear. So what they talk about there with mindset um, you have to go into this understanding that these are technical rescues. Um, this isn't something that, uh, you know, you can just uh, jump in and, and, and uh, work without the proper training. Um, and then obviously you need your per, uh, proper personal protective gear. Um, equipment and gear should be appropriate to anticipate um, the hazard. So again, don't operate unless you have the, the appropriate equipment to handle those particular hazards. Um, obviously, gloves, um, protective gear that you're you're going to be required as an EMT to wear. Um, always, regardless of the rescue incident, you need to have um, moisture, uh, you know, uh, latex or nitrile uh, EMS gloves. So, like anything else, we're going to put on our pair of, of EMS gloves. If you need some sort of um, you know cut protection. Um, uh, anything else like like a pair of leather gloves over top of those gloves, that's fine. But remember, you've got to have your EMS gloves on. A lot of the uh, cut resistant gloves are not waterproof. They're, they're, they allow moisture to flow through them. So if you have one of those, uh, a set of those gloves on and you touch the patient and now that patient, um, you know, has uh, transfers blood over to those gloves, there is a possibility for that to, to seep through that that fabric. Um, and come in contact with your hands. So always have a pair of EMS gloves underneath whatever uh, other personal protective gear that you're wearing. Um, so, uh, vehicle safety systems. Um, we we I know in the in the previous chapters we've talked about um, airbag deployment and uh, the the, the uh, you know you have to be aware of the fact that some of these safety systems may not have activated during the crash and they may still be primed and, and ready to ready to go ready to blow at any point during this extrication so positioning yourself in a vehicle we'll talk a, a little bit in a, uh, excuse me we'll talk in a, in a little bit about how you may be positioned inside of a of a vehicle while the patient's being extricated positioning yourself so that you're aware of those hazards is is vitally important to your safety um, so there's things like loaded bumpers, bumpers that have, um, you know, uh, 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 pistons, hydraulic pistons in them um, that can release at any point that can injure you, break your legs, 
uh, break your knees, those kind of things. Um, airbags, uh, we, we talk, again, we talked about airbags before, but just keep in mind that vehicles nowadays, newer vehicles, have airbags um, all throughout the vehicle, side curtains, um, certainly in the steering wheel and the dash. Uh, there are some down towards the legs uh, in the, you know, below the dash. Um, so there's airbags everywhere in cars. So just be cognizant of that and understand that you need to place yourself in a safe position. Majority of the time, those safe positions are where a passenger would normally sit in that vehicle. So one of the things that I like to think about, if I enter a vehicle while that patient's being extricated, I will try to position myself if I'm, if I'm entering that vehicle to provide, you know, C-spine or some sort of procedure for that patient. I'm going to try to position myself in that vehicle as if I was a passenger of the vehicle. That way, if an airbag does go off, um, I should be in a safe location. Yeah, it may it may hit me. It may, um, you know, come in contact with me, but it's not going to produce the forces um, necessary to cause injury to me. So just something to think about as far as airbags. Um Always use your pro uh, protective gear to reduce the risk of eye or lung irritation from those airbags. So having a mask on, having uh, safety glasses on is, is important when we're dealing with airbags. Um, so let's talk about the fundamentals of extrication. Extrication is the removal uh, from entrapment or a dangerous situation or position. You may provide care as the extra extrication goes on around you. So I mentioned that before. You may be in a position where... Um, as the, the lead EMT, you're going to be placed inside the vehicle with that patient um, while the, the rescue technicians are um, extricating that patient from the vehicle. So there's kind of two separate things going on on auto accidents. Number one is the, the, the rescue company, the rescue technicians, they are concerned with getting that patient out of the vehicle. Well, the other thing that needs to be happening is someone needs to be in contact with that patient treating that patient, assessing that patient while that process is going on. We can't just leave the person in there all by themselves while we extricate them because some of these extrications can take 20, 30 minutes um, to complete. So a lot of times, like I said before, we'll place uh, an EMT in the vehicle with the patient, providing care as that extrication goes on around you. So just be cognizant of that. Know that you're going to have to have safety gear on. You're going to have to have a helmet on, gloves eye protection, potentially a mask, um, you know, all of those things are important. Uh, entrapment is a condition in which a person is caught within a closed area with no way out or, or has a limb or other body part trapped. So sometimes the doors of the vehicle will open, but the person's leg is, is trapped, you know, so there's, there's multiple different, um, you know, types of, of um, entrapment that we can encounter. All right, so we're going to talk through these 10 phases of extrication. Um, Certainly, uh, I don't want you guys to, to memorize these, these 10 phases of extrication. That's not important. Um, you know, you're not, you're not going to see any questions uh, on our exam, certainly not the registry about one of the phases of extrication. But I want you to just be aware of each of these phases so that you, you understand the process of, of what goes on during an, an extrication. All right, so before we get into the, uh, to the phases, we're going to talk about roles and responsibilities. Um, EMS personnel responsible for assessing and providing medical care, triage and packaging, providing additional assessment and care uh, as needed once patients are removed, and then providing transport to the emergency department. So again, as I mentioned before, everybody has their roles, and your role as the EMT is taking care of that patient. Um, your role is not to how to get the patient out of the vehicle. You are simply there to take care of the patient and give status updates to the rescue technicians on the patient's current condition. And that's gonna change some of the, the things that they're going to, uh, that they're gonna do during that extrication. It's gonna change their course of action based on what you're telling them about the patient's current condition. Um, so that's your, you're assessing, you're providing that medical care. Triaging and packaging, obviously once the patient is extricated, once they are out of that vehicle, it's up to you to determine how they need to be packaged. Do they need to be on a long spine board? Do they need to be secured to the cot? Whatever the case may be, do they need to have a, a C collar on? That's all up to you. Um, providing additional assessment once they're removed, obviously you're gonna um, you know, continue that assessment and, and treatment uh, as you go towards the ambulance, into the ambulance and on the way to the hospital. So talking about the rescue's role and responsibility, the rescue team is responsible for securing and stabilizing the vehicle. 
um, providing a safe safe entrance and access to the patient. So, you know, you're not required to find your own way into the vehicle. The rescue team should get you into the vehicle if you need to be in with the patient. And then their role, uh, again, is, is extricating those patients. Um, law enforcement on the scene of, a, of a, an auto accident is responsible for controlling traffic, maintaining order, um, and establishing a, a, a perimeter. Firefighters uh, would be responsible for extinguishing any fire, preventing ignition, um, ensuring the scene safety, um, taking care of things like you know removing the the, uh, the battery uh, from the vehicle uh, so that we reduce the chance of of uh, you know ha- having those airbags um, go off potentially, um, removing or containing any spilled fuel. Those are all responsibilities of the firefighters. And again, you may work somewhere. You know, after this this course, you may end up working somewhere where you fit a couple of these different roles. You may be a firefighter, a rescue technician, and an EMT. You may be doing some of these things, you know, simultaneously or in conjunction, very close conjunction with other with other folks. All right, so we're getting into the phases here. The preparation phase, um, preparing for an incident, um, requiring extrication involves training. So again, if you're going to be um, more closely involved with this, so if you're going to be working in a, a fire-based EMS where, where you have the higher probability of responding to an auto accident, make sure that you're, you're, you're getting some additional training. That you're working with the rescue technicians at your station um, to, to come up with a plan of action right, for, uh, for an auto accident or any other rescue incident for that matter. Um, rescue personnel must routinely check their extrication tools tools and their response vehicles. Again, not your responsibility if you're not the rescue technician, but just know that they're they're checking their equipment as well. On the way to the scene, procedures and safety precautions similar to those in the phases of an ambulance call are used when responding to a rescue incident. So similarly, like we talked about with um, responding to an, an EMS run, um, responding to a, a rescue or an, an extrication incident, uh, you're going to be thinking about your safety. You're going to be coming up with a preliminary plan of action based on that dispatch information. All right, once you arrive at the scene um, in, in the scene size up, uh, you're going to position the ambulance to block the scene from oncoming traffic. And I, I did mention um, in the last uh, lecture, chapter 37, talked about uh, using the equipment to block traffic. My personal p- opinion on this is if if the, the if the medic the ambulance is is not required to block traffic, I would prefer the ambulance not block traffic because we're going to be have to be getting in and out of the back of that ambulance when we when we transfer the patient into the into the ambulance. So I don't prefer that ambulance to block the scene from oncoming traffic. Now, if if you're the first to arrive or there's no other equipment on the scene and, and nobody's blocking the traffic, then yes, absolutely. You need to make that scene safe for you as you're operating out on the roadway. So you can certainly use the ambulance to block traffic. But again, not ideal. I would prefer that ambulance to be protected because it's going to be filled with uh, crew members and a patient. Um, once you arrive on the scene, make sure that your PPE is on. Always look for passing cars before exiting your vehicle. This is the uh, most dangerous place that we take runs. The most dangerous runs that we go on are on on the roadways, uh, particularly on the interstates. Um, so make sure that you're looking for passing cars. You you would think that people would slow down as they see emergency vehicles. They don't. They don't slow down. They don't move over. Um, so be always be cognizant. Just always assume that those vehicles are coming coming for you. Uh, and keep yourself in a position where they can't get you. Uh, make sure the scene is properly marked and protected. So if you, if if again, if you're first on the scene, uh, deploying some cones, deploying some flares, all those things would be appropriate at this point. Um, size up is the ongoing process of scene assessments to determine the strategies and tactics to manage an emergency. So part of your size up as an EMT on an auto accident is determining, okay, do I have someone... Um, uh, trapped? Is there someone who, who's in need of extrication out of this vehicle? That's that's definitely your job. That's definitely part of your job as you arrive on the scene is, is to say, all right, this patient, um, you know, this patient needs immobilized and their door won't open. I cannot have that patient crawl out the window because they're complaining of back pain, neck pain, uh, their numbness or tingling in their legs. I, I'm not going to have that person crawl over a console or crawl out of a window when they have a potential for a spinal cord injury. So that's the point where you then need to make the decision, hey, this person needs backboarded out of this vehicle. 
um, that we need them extricated. And that's your call to make. And that's perfectly, um, uh, you know, w- well within your uh, scope of practice there. So you would then report that during your size up um, to the rescue technicians that, hey, I've got someone who needs extricated. Situational awareness, ability to recognize uh, possible issues and act proactively to avoid a negative impact. You need to maintain a high situational awareness on auto accident scenes. Again, again, especially when you're on the highway, the interstate, when you've got cars coming past you very, very quickly. Make sure that you're aware of your surroundings or aware of your situation. Um, do a 360 walk around of the of the vehicle. Um, you want to identify some of the uh, mechanisms of injury. So uh, identifying uh, quickly what type of an auto accident was this? Did this vehicle roll over? Was it a T-bone? Was it head on? Was it a rear end? Um, again, you're determining if there's any trapped or ejected patients. You need to determine the number of patients uh, and vehicles involved. <clears throat> Excuse me. And keep in mind, vehicles may not always be very close to each other. They were involved in a high-speed auto accident. One vehicle, you know, the vehicles could be 100 feet apart. You need to determine uh, quickly the number of patients in all vehicles uh, involved so that you can uh, request uh, the proper assistance. You know, you can request additional medics, uh, those types of things. And then certainly safety concerns. So if the vehicle does not appear to be stabilized, you need to report that to the rescue tech so that those those, uh, rescue folks can, can stabilize the vehicle, things like that. Well, looking at the vehicle, note the damage. So as you're, again, this is during that, that 360 scene size up, as you're walking up to the scene, you're looking at the vehicle. You're looking for the steering wheel. Is the steering wheel bent? Is there any imprints on the dashboard? You know, is there, uh, uh, or do the patients, do the patients or the occupants of the vehicle have their seatbelts on? Um, is the windshield uh, broken? Is it spider webbed? You know, that's indicative of them hit striking the windshield with their head. Make sure to document those findings in your report, you know, after this run. Um, always maintain a high index index of suspicion with any auto accident. So remember, high index of suspicion. We're going to assume that that this person has, you know, injuries. We're going to assume that that this auto accident was was you know significant. Evaluate the need for additional resources. I already mentioned that. Um, you know, if you see that you need uh, rescue technicians, if you see that you need. Um, you know, if the, maybe the vehicle smoking and you think it might, you know, potential to, to catch on fire, you need to make sure that there's, there's, uh, you know, enough, enough fire equipment there. Other potential hazards that you may see, uh, spilled fuel or flammables. Um, uh, I, I witnessed somebody once, um, there was a, a vehicle that, uh, actually a truck, a larger, larger, uh, uh, semi truck that uh, had one of the saddle tanks, one of the 50-gallon uh, tanks of fuel that has was ruptured, and they had the vehicle had continued down the roadway for some distance, spilling that fuel out before it came to a stop. And, uh, and there was a firefighter uh, on the scene that was, um, that was working on traffic control at the moment um, and started to deploy some flares. And, and we had to quickly, you know, let them know, hey, there's fuel all over the ground. So be cognizant of that. You know, you don't want to throw a flare down on top of fuel. So that's a point where we're going to, if we've got, if we've got traffic cones, traffic cones are a better option in that, in that particular, uh, situation. Uh, electrical shorts, damaged batteries, you see any elect- electrical issues, that's certainly something that you need to, to be aware of. Rain, sleet, snow, um, crashes that occur on hills, what they're talking about there, if the crash is on a hill over the crest of a hill, um, you need to ensure that someone is blocking traffic on the other side of that hill because folks will come over that hill at normal speeds and they may not have enough time to see the accident and slow down in time. So uh, just be cognizant of that if you're on a hill, um, if you're on the other side of the crest of a hill, you need to make sure that somebody's blocking traffic back on the other side of that hill. Check for violence. Um you know, these auto accidents, rescue incidences, they can, they can uh, you know, cause, you know, anxieties to be elevated and, and folks to potentially get violent. So um, be, be aware of that. Be cognizant of that. Um, talked about electrical short or damaged battery. One of the uh, big things that we see with auto accidents is, is power lines down, um, power lines down on the vehicle. Um, make sure that you are not entering a vehicle that has live power lines down on it. Power lines, um, even if even if you're unsure whether or not they're live, um, always assume that those power lines are live um, until 
uh, it's confirmed with a power company that they're not. So if you've got power lines down on a vehicle, assume that they're live and do not come close to that vehicle. You're going to want to call for uh, rescue companies. You want to call for the power company at, you know, on emergency so that they can get there and properly remove that. You never want to remove that unless you've been trained to remove power lines. Um, there are some tools that rescue rescue companies carry um, that that can that can help to to uh, remove those uh, power lines like polypropylene rope. Um, but unless you are trained to do so, you're going to stay back from that situation. You're not going to want to uh, come close to that vehicle or touch those power lines. Coordinate your efforts with rescue teams and law enforcement. So again, communication is key here. Uh, don't get into a, a, a position where you uh, just assume that the rescue team, that the police, that the incident commander, don't just assume that they know what's going on. Make sure to communicate everything with the rescue team, incident commander, police officers, all of that. Everybody needs to you know, uh, be aware of the situation. If you think that this person is, is crashing, if you think that they're going into shock or that, that they need rapidly extricated, you need to communicate that with the, with the rescue team. Um, and again, you may enter the vehicle to provide patient care. That's only when you're, you know, advised to do so. Obviously, you want. Obviously, the rescue team needs to make sure that 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 vehicle is safe for you to enter before you before you go in and attempt patient care. Uh, and I, I already alluded to this: down electrical lines, common hazard. Never move them. Um, you can instruct the patient to remain in the vehicle until the power is shut off. Um, remain in the safe zone outside of the hot zone. So don't don't come anywhere close. You know, you're gonna maintain 15 to 20 feet away from any any power lines that are on the ground. Uh, bystanders and family can create hazard. Um, we see this all the time. Somebody gets into an auto accident. The first thing they call, the first person they call, is a family member. They say, "Hey, I just got into an auto accident. I'm over here on you know whatever Main Street and whatever." And the family all, you know, decides to show up all at the same time and they park their cars right in the middle of the road and they they come running up and, you know, just just try to keep those bystanders and family members away. We don't want them to come in contact with our rescue tools. They don't want them to come in contact with um, any hazards that are on that scene. Um, the vehicle can also be a hazard. Um, unstable vehicles, if it's on its side, if it's on its roof, if it's moving at all, uh, consider it unstable and advise the, the rescue team that, that uh, they need to stabilize the vehicle. Um, ensure that the car is in park with the parking brake set and the ignition turned off. So if, you've, if, you, um, if the vehicle appears stable or even after the, the rescue uh, uh, team has stabilized the vehicle, when you enter that vehicle uh, to, to provide patient care, um, if you can, make sure to put the vehicle into park and set the parking brake and turn the ignition off. Uh, alternate fuel vehicles and hybrid vehicles, uh, just be aware that there's some more electricity hazards, electrical hazards, um, potential fuel hazards, propane, natural gas. Some of these vehicles run off of some alternate fuels uh, and, and that can cause some different problems. So if you see a hybrid vehicle or an electric vehicle, just be aware of the fact that there's uh, that potential for an additional hazard. Um, support operations. Support operations include lighting of the scene, establishing um, tool and equipment staging areas. Um, we've talked about helicopter landing zones before. Um, these are all operations that, that you may or may not be a part of as an EMT. Um, generally, you know, you're going to have uh, a fire company that's establishing the landing zone for the helicopter. But again, you may be the person who needs to call for that helicopter. So just, again, teamwork here, communication, working together um, to make sure that these support operations are taken care of is, is important. Um, as far as gaining access to the vehicle, ensure that the vehicle is stable and hazards are eliminated or controlled prior to gaining access. Um, the method to gain access depends on the situation. Um, so uh, again, it, is this vehicle, um, can I open the door? That's a simple access, right? I can open the door and access the patient. Um, if the door is jammed, if I can't open the door, um, can I break a window to access that patient? You know, those are different methods of access. Sometimes the vehicle is so damaged that the, the rescue team has to cut the roof off the vehicle for us to get access. It's the only access, only available access. Um, is the, is the uh, patient or, um, 
excuse me, is the patient in a vehicle or other structure? Um, are they in, um, you know, is, was this vehicle, did this vehicle hit a structure? Is the structure stable? Be cognizant of these things. Again, these aren't, these aren't things that you're going to fix necessarily, um, but, but if you can recognize them quickly and pass that information along to um, the rescue team, the incident commander, that's going to help, uh, you know, that's going to help this entire process. Rapid extrication may be needed to remove a patient who needs resuscitation. So if you've got a patient who's, um, who appears to be in cardiac arrest um, and they need resuscitation, we're not going to wait 20 or 30 minutes for the rescue team um, to come in and pop the door open if that's the case. If they're not there, they're not ready to go, um, we may not have the option to wait. Uh, because this person needs CPR, we're going to rapidly extricate them. So when we talk about a rapid extrication, um, we talk about essentially pulling this person out of the vehicle. And it may not be the most stable way to get them out of the vehicle, but it's it's the quickest way to get them out of the vehicle so that we can begin resuscitation. Um, keep this patient safe. Um, a heavy, non-flammable uh, blanket can protect them from flying glass or other objects. Um, talk to them. Explain to them what's happening. So if you are in the vehicle with them, um, putting a heavy blanket over top of them can protect them. And then talk to them. Just let them know, hey, we're cutting you out of your car. We're here to help you. You know, what's what's you know, anything we can do to, to, you know, make you feel better right now. Um, those kind of things are all, all good, uh, all good information to, to talk to them about. All right. So we're going to talk through some of these different access, um, options that you have simple access, accessing the patient without using tools or blade or breaking any glass. So you're going to try the door handle. You're going to try to roll down windows before using it, before breaking anything, right? This is that old uh, moniker. If you've been through fire school, you've talked about it. Um, try before you pry. So try to open the door before you go uh, using tools and breaking things and bending things. So try before you pry. That's simple access. Um, complex access requires specialized tools. Uh, pneumatic tools, hand tools, hydraulic rescue tools. So this is where we actually provide, you know, a, a, an actual extrication, a rescue extrication out of the vehicle. That's a complex access. Emergency care, perform um, a primary assessment and provide care before further extrication. So, <clears throat> again, your role, this is this is where we talk about your role <clears throat> in an auto accident case. Your role in these cases is to um, provide this emergency care and report those findings to the rescue team, <clears throat> excuse me, so that that rescue team knows how quickly and what method they need to use to get that person out of the vehicle. So you're going to get, you know, whether you're in the vehicle, whether you're outside the vehicle, you're going to do your best to provide manual stabilization of the spine, open the airway, provide oxygen if needed, um, assist or provide adequate ventilation. If they need bagged, you're going to get a BVM and you're going to bag them. You may be in that vehicle with them while you're doing that. Control any uh, significant external bleeding. It's common in auto accidents, other rescue incidents that this patient may have an injury. It's causing them bleeding. You may be in that vehicle or in you know somewhere in the in the incident you may be you know applying a tourniquet providing direct pressure just to control bleeding um, so you're going to treat those critical injuries uh, address life-threatening external hemorrhage before airway and breathing so as always when we see bleeding we're going to stop bleeding right away because if they're still bleeding we're not nothing else we're going to do is going to be able to save them. Um, again you're going to coordinate with the rescue personnel uh, to determine the best removal uh, route so the urgency of the extrication, that's going to be up to you. That's going to be your decision to make how urgent we're extricating this patient. If you get into that vehicle with them or whatever the rescue incident is, and you're in that space with them and you assess them and you find that this patient is not injured, their, their vital signs are stable, they're not, have, they don't have any complaints, they just simply can't get out of the vehicle, then you're going to relay that information so that the rescue team can slow everything down, right? There's no urgency there. We're going to do this as safe and, and slow and methodical as possible because this person isn't, isn't hurt versus you get into that vehicle and they're in and out of consciousness. They've got an altered mental status. Their, school, their skin is pale, cool, and clammy. You're going to say, hey, this patient's unstable. We need to get them out ASAP. We need to get them out right away. That's going to tell that rescue team, all right, 
we're gonna go we're gonna we're gonna go a little faster with this, right? It's gonna be a little more urgent, a lot more urgent. We're gonna we're gonna use our techniques that get this patient out as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and then you may have a case where you get in there and they're in cardiac arrest, and you decide that we're gonna we're gonna res attempt resuscitation at this patient, and you relay that to the rescue team, and they forego all those me uh, methods. They break the glass and they drag the person out of the vehicle. So, you know, there's different uh, urgencies there, and that's going to be up to you. Um, determine the position to best protect the patient. So again, what's best for them? Do we need to put them on a backboard when they come out if they've got? <clears throat> signs of a spinal cord injury, then yes, they need to be placed on a backboard. Um, determine how you will move, move that patient. So you're going to be at the head of the patient, ideally, and you're going to be instructing everyone how to move the patient. Again, once we have access to be able to move that patient, now it becomes your responsibility to tell everybody how, how you're going to move them based on your findings of your assessment. Again, your input is essential. I can't stress that enough. Do not hesitate to talk to the rescue technicians. And, and let them know what you think needs to happen with the patient. Um, again, if you are in the vehicle, wear your proper PPE. Um, transfer the patient once the patient's free. Uh, uh, perform a, another primary assessment. So we're going to continually perform. The, the thing about um, rescue incidents is auto extrications, you know, all these, all any type of rescue incident. We don't get to see a, a clear picture of the entire person until we get them fully extricated. So you're going to perform a primary assessment when you, you know, let's say you get into the vehicle with them, you're going to perform a quick primary assessment. When you get them out of the vehicle, you're going to have to perform another primary assessment, right? You, you're, you're still assessing things you haven't seen yet. Um, ensure that the spine is manually stabilized if necessary with, with most of these. If you're extricating the patient, chances are you need to stabilize the spine. Um, move the patient in a series of controlled steps. So um, we, we want to go smooth. Um, you know, really this step is going to be relatively slow. We don't, we don't want to uh, grab them and start dragging them if we don't need to. Um, so if the patient is, is not in cardiac arrest, we're going to go slow, methodical. I mean, really, even if they are in cardiac arrest, you still want to go slow and move in a coordinated effort. Okay. All right, termination, termination. This is the termination phase of, of a rescue incident, and that involves returning um, the emergency units to service. Um, all equipment must be checked and replaced. Uh, clean the ambulance. Um, you know, these are generally messy um, events, not just meaning from the patient, but, you know, there's, there's mud, dirt, debris, oil, fuel, all kinds of things all over your equipment. So spend some time to, uh, to make sure everything gets clean up, cleaned up properly. All right, so we'll switch gears to, to some different specialized rescue situations. Um, sometimes um, if for these specialized rescues, uh, patients can only be really uh, reached by special teams. So some examples there, cave rescue, confined space, um, cross field or trail rescue, and dive rescue. So <clears throat> again, just like with auto extrication, y you shouldn't be doing these things if you haven't been properly trained. So as far as confined space rescue, let's say you've got somebody trapped in a, a, you know, a grain bin or a fuel tank or, you know, something, some conf sort of confined space. The first thing that you need to do is call for, you know, uh, you know, keep yourself safe and call for the right rescuers, call for the right resources. If you've got a trench rescue, you need a trench rescue team. You, you, you have to call for that. You have to request that information. Don't attempt rescues um, for these specialty type situations without pro proper training. Um, so here's just another you know big list of some specialized rescue teams that you may need you, you may need to call you may need to be aware of. Uh, mine rescue missing persons uh, or or uh, uh, mountain rock ice climbing those kind of things. Um, ski or snow rescue you know not not a huge deal around here in Ohio. Um, structural collapse. Um, SWAT teams, so we'll talk about uh, some SWAT team stuff here in a little bit. Technical rescue, trench rescue, um, water and small craft rescue. So anytime you're out on the water, certainly white water rescue. All of those things are specialized and you need to contact those specialized teams um, to rescue those people. Personnel need specialized training and equipment, so it's incredibly unsafe for you um, to, to work in those uh, rescue situations unless you've been trained. Uh, many te technical rescue team uh, members are also EMTs. So 
that's a good opportunity for you in the future as an EMT. Uh, those re- specialized rescue teams want EMTs. They want medical professionals on the team because that's going to give them that perspective uh, when they're in there, do you know, performing the rescue. So, you know, a little little um, uh, you know thought for you to think about is 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 in the future. Maybe you want to be a part of one of these uh, specialized rescue teams. Uh, when you arrive, you'll be directed uh, or led to a staging area. You're going to set up your equipment in a staging area. Um, sometimes that staging area, especially if it's like a wide area search uh, or a large area event, you know, where you're searching in the, you know, in the woods for missing persons or something. So a lot of times you'll be staged uh, with the incident commander. Um, you're going to want to set up your equipment at that staging area, um, perform your assessment of the situation. Um, Anytime the rescue team brings you the patient, you're going to take over care. You're going to initiate and take over care at that point. Um, And this is a joint effort. Um, As far as search and rescue goes, the ambulance is usually summoned to the command post. As I mentioned before, when a person is lost outdoors um, and a search effort is initiated, so you're either going to a staging area somewhere or you're going to a command post. And your role is simply to stand by until someone is found or rescued. Um, Once that person's found or rescued, you may be guided uh, to that patient or they may bring that patient to you based on the situation. So uh, just be aware that that you may um, you may be moved around based on the needs of that patient. And you're just going to you're just going to follow the the, uh, orders of the incident commander. Uh, So let's talk about trench rescue. Trench rescue is incredibly dangerous. Uh, Many cave ins and trench collapse have very poor outcomes for the victims um, a very uh, low rate of, of, of rescue in these cases. We, you know, rarely do we save a, a victim of a trench collapse, but it is possible. Um, collapses usually involve uh, large areas of falling dirt. Victims cannot fully expand their lungs and may become hypoxic. So it, it doesn't take the person to be completely buried in a trench for them to die. Uh, they can simply be buried up to their chest and they can't expand their lungs uh, and they can't breathe and basically they, they suffocate to death. Uh, risk of secondary collapse is a, of a, a, a major concern. The biggest, one of the biggest things to think about as you arrive on the scene of a trench rescue is where you're going to uh, park your vehicle, where you're going to stage your vehicle. And this is important because trenches um, can cause, so there can be some secondary collapses in a trench, and those are caused by the vibrations of vehicles. So it's really important to keep your vehicle away from the scene. And the book talks about at least 500 feet from the scene, and I would agree with that. I would say certainly call into the incident commander as you're arriving um, to uh, ask them where you think where they think it's safe um, to park. Um, if you are anywhere close, you should turn your vehicle off. Um, again, the vibrations are the, the most important thing to think about with these uh, trench rescues because you're going to cause secondary collapse. So the person may be buried up to their legs. Uh, and they just need help getting out, and then you drive your vehicle up right next to the trench, and you cause the the trench wall to collapse in, and now you completely bury the person and they die. So it's incredibly important um, for you to to park away from these trench rescues. Never enter a trench uh, without proper shoring in place. And again, this goes back to uh, don't do something that you're not trained to do. Um, so we're not going to enter a trench. A lot of times with trench rescues, you're gonna if you arrive, if you happen to arrive on the scene, the construction crew or you know family members, friends, whoever's there is going to be trying to dig this person out. Um, please resist the temptation to go in and help them start digging. If there's still a trench there, if if there's still the ability for the trench walls to collapse, secondary collapse again is a high probability. You need to try to get everybody out of that trench and call for a specialized uh, trench rescue trench rescue team. Um, tactical emergency medical support. So we're talking about SWAT teams, and this is called um, uh, TEMS, T-E-M-S, Tactical Emergency Medical Support. A lot of fire departments have TEMS teams, um, and these are EMTs and paramedics that uh, are teamed up with the SWAT team. Uh, that are teamed up with police officers and they provide initial care to um, victims out of those SWAT incidents. So they a lot of times they're teamed up to provide care simply for the, the law enforcement officers, simply for the, the SWAT teams. 
Um, but sometimes they'll have a medic standing by there just in case, you know, if they're going to raid a home or something, uh, you know, they, they may have a medic standing by there. Um, if you've got bulletproof vests, you know, make sure that you're wearing ballistic vest. Um, certainly report to the incident commander when, when, uh, when you're, when you're uh, arrive at the scene. Uh, a lot of times they turn off lights and sirens, uh, when you get close to these events, Sometimes they're they're working on a negotiation, or the element of surprise is part of their their plan. So just make sure that you're not coming in there, you know, with your siren blasting, um, to, to you know to give away their their location. Uh, structure fires um, in most areas, uh, Central Ohio included, an ambulance dispatched is dispatched with the fire department uh, to a structure fire. Um, again, Central Ohio, a lot of it fire-based EMS, so most fire departments have ambulances. Obviously, the ambulance is going to be part of that that uh, structure fire response. What's your role at a structure fire? Your role is to stage your vehicle and be prepared to um, treat either victims of the fire or be pre- prepared to treat um, firefighters who may be injured. Um, so you may be providing victim care. You may be providing uh, care to injured firefighters, and you may be providing um, rehab to firefighters. So there's possibility that you will set up, um, you know, your ambulance to provide a cool place for the the, the firefighters to come in and um, take a break. You know, get them something to drink, check their vital signs, uh, those types of things. All right, so we're going to go through a few review questions here. Um, I have pulled a couple of these questions out, so the numbers are a little bit um, off, but. Uh, we'll just go through a handful of questions. Um, number one, proper protection, equ- or excuse me, proper protective equipment will vary dependent upon the hazards encountered. Which piece of equipment should be utilized during all patient contacts? Turnout gear, helmets, um, blood and fluid impermeable, impermeable gloves, or goggles? And the answer here is C, um, blood and fluid impermeable gloves. And as I mentioned before, um, always have those protective gloves on. Um, under even if it's underneath, you know, other gloves or other things. So depending on the rescue instance, you may have to wear turnout gear, you may have to wear helmets, you may have to wear goggles. But regardless, if there's a patient contact, you absolutely have to wear your uh, protective gloves. All right, as you approach an unconscious patient who is still in her wrecked vehicle, you know that there's a power line entangled in the wreckage of the vehicle. Which of the following should you do? You can go ahead and pause the video and read through those. And the answer here for number three is A, retreat until the power line has been removed or the power is shut off. And I will add to that that you're going to want to call um, for the power company on emergency. You're going to want to call for um, fire companies if they're not already on the way or rescue company that has the ability to assist in uh, removing that, that power line. All right, next, uh, a 30-year-old semi-conscious man is pinned by a, by the steering wheel of his badly wrecked vehicle. Um, once access has been gained to the patient, the EMT should do what? So once, so you've got a semi-conscious man, badly wrecked vehicle. Once access has been gained to the patient, what should the EMD, uh, excuse me, EMT do at this point? Um, and you can pause the video, give you a second to read the, the questions. And the answer here is C, um, per, uh, perform a primary assessment and provide any needed emergency care uh, prior to the extrication. So unless there's any immediate threat to fire, explosion, or other danger, you should perform that primary assessment. Treat any immediate life threats as soon as you have gained access uh, to the patient. All right, number six, uh, while the EMT is in a vehicle assessing the patient, the rescue team should be doing what? And you can pause the video to review those uh, possible answers. And the answer for uh, number six is A, assessing exactly how the patient is trapped and determining the safest way to extricate. So again, not your responsibility to do that. Uh, that's the rescue teams, but it's, it's important for you to be aware that that's what they should be doing Um, once you've gained access into the vehicle. All 
All right, number seven, proper removal of a critically injured patient from an automobile involves what? And I'll get, you can pause the video and read through those. And the answer for number seven is C, moving the patient in a smooth, slow, controlled steps. So I, I, I talked about that a little bit is, is important. It's important to move that patient slow, controlled, smoothly as you get them out of that uh, vehicle, especially if they're critically injured. We don't want to cause any further injury to that patient by, by you know, dragging them out of the vehicle, uh, you know, unless that's absolutely important, meaning they need resuscitation. All right, number eight, a man has been um, sucked inside of a grain bin, uh, excuse me, a bin of a grain silo and is trapped. Uh, which of the following rescue teams is the most appropriate to request? So you're in a uh, grain silo. Is that trench rescue, high angle rescue, local fire department, or confined space? Um, the answer there for eight is D, confined space. So anytime they're inside of a, of a tank, a grain bin, a silo, anytime where they're in a, an area where there's a very, very small entrance and exit point, that's confined space rescue. So you would want to contact the confined space rescue team uh, for your local area um, and get them, all, excuse me, get them on the way as soon as possible. Number nine, you respond to a wooded area um, to help search for a child who has been missing for approximately 24 hours. Which of the following equipment should you leave in the ambulance? Um, radio, flashlight, jump kit, and backboard. So what this question is really looking for is what equipment are you taking and which equipment should you leave uh, in the ambulance with you? And the answer for this one is uh, D, the backboard. Um, and what they're, what they're getting at here with this question is is that you don't want to take any um, large heavy equipment with you because you may be tra uh, traveling um, for you know a long distance while you're searching um, for that for that missing person. Um, we, we wouldn't we wouldn't gather any of that larger equipment until we know where that person is at because we don't want to waste our time and energy by by lugging around you know a large backboard unless we know that we actually need it and where that person is. All right, and finally, number 10, you are dispatched to the scene of a trench collapse. Upon arriving at the scene, your ambulance should be parked at least how many feet from the incident? 250, 500, 750, or 1,000. Um, for this one year, you should be uh, parked at least 500 feet away from the incident. So the answer there is B. Remember, we want to stay, keep our vehicles away from those trenches to prevent that secondary trench collapse uh, from the vibration of our vehicles. All right, and that wraps up chapter 38.